We're going to pick up this evening right where we left off last Wednesday night, and we have been dealing with how we should live in the reality of the incarnation and in the reality of the resurrection and everything that Jesus has done for us. And we left off last Wednesday evening dealing with how we should pray accordingly. And we ended with 1 John 5 and verse 15, which says, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, and of course, when we read that word ask, we think of presenting a petition or a request, and there is a prayer that is a prayer of petition or request, but the word there for ask is actually a teo, which means demand. Now, as we learned last Wednesday night, that doesn't mean that we demand in a prideful or arrogant or in a, an abusive way. What it means is that we, it's whatever we demand as our rights and privileges under the new covenant, knowing who we are in Christ, knowing all that he did for us, knowing who we are in Christ, knowing our rights and privileges. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we demand, we know that we have what we have demanded of him. Whatever we demand as our rights, as our privileges under the new covenant. So we're to know and live in the reality of the incarnation and the resurrection and we are to pray accordingly as the sons, as the daughters of Almighty God. We're to also walk in the reality of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And the last few Sunday mornings, we've been learning about the Holy Spirit. Turn to John 14, beginning in verse 15. As I said a few Sunday mornings ago, the Holy Spirit is the one who is here with us. And he fills us, he indwells us, and we ought to live as if that is a reality in our lives. John 14, beginning in verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. So he lives with us. He's the one that is here with us. Father God is in heaven. Jesus, the Bible tells us, is seated at the right hand of the Father. So the Holy Spirit is the one who is here with us. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And that's why how we live as Christians matters. That's why what, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and Sunday, my father said Sunday's message was uh, going where angels fear to tread. But when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, it's why he dealt with the reality that what we do with our lives, with, with even our bodies, matters because he indwells us. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So he is with us and he is in us. Say, he is with me. He is with me. Say, he is in me. He is in me. Say it again. Say, he is with me, he is with me. and he is, he is in me. So that's not just when we're in church on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night or even when we're in a situation like this, watching from home with the family. Uh, wherever you are, wherever you're living. He, he's with us all the time. He's with you in the car, the way to work. He's with you when someone cuts you off. He's with you when it's a great day. He's with you when uh, it's a challenging day. He's with us at all times. And so we have to live mindful of that reality that he is with us and he is in us. And that ought to affect what we say, what we do, how we think, how we treat one another. On Pentecost, four things took place in the upper room. Now, I know a few Sunday mornings ago we were in Acts 2, but let's look at it from a different perspective. On Pentecost, four things took place in the upper room. Turn to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of, of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So first we see that the disciples were immersed in the Holy Spirit. He came on the day of Pentecost. And on that day when the Holy Spirit came, they were born of the Spirit. It would have been impossible for any man or woman to be born again until the coming of the Holy Spirit because we are born again by the Spirit. So on that day, they received eternal life and they became new creations in Christ. And aside from Jesus, they were the first people who were born again. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers, and he is also the firstborn from among the dead. 
I'm going to give you a few verses to back that up. Romans 8, 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Then Colossians 1, 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Then Revelation 1 and verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he paid the price for us. He paid the price you or I could never pay. And he was raised from the dead, but also he was the first to be born again. And then on the day of Pentecost, they were born again. They were born of the spirit. Their, their spirit man was born again. And so they were born of the spirit on that day. Acts 2 and verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. And you have to keep in mind that, of course, Luke, based on the reports he heard, is describing what people said happened in the best way he can. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So second, tongues of fire indicated how the gospel would be proclaimed. The Bible speaks of God making his servants flames of fire. And uh, there, there's something to that, amen? One of my favorite preachers is Charles Finney. He was the main preacher of the Second Great Awakening. And before he was born again, he was a lawyer. And because he was a lawyer and a very effective lawyer, his presentation of the gospel was always very different. And uh, he, appro he approached it very logically, very rationally. If this is true, this must be true. If that's true, this must be true. And then he also believed that you could repeat certain steps to get the same result every time. And that irritates people in seminary because they're of the perspective, well, you know, something's only going to happen if God wants it to happen. Whereas someone like Finney would say, well, if you want God to do X or Y, you just follow these steps and it'll, it'll happen every single time. But he was uh, very opinionated. And he would write things like, if you never want to win anyone to the Lord, this is what your ministry should look like. And uh, he got people's attention, but he had a tongue of fire. Every, every great man or woman of God has a tongue of fire. George Whitfield had a tongue of fire. I love the accounts of Benjamin Franklin, who was agnostic, but he loved to go hear George Whitfield preach outside of Boston. And uh, Benjamin Franklin himself said that he would leave his change, his money at home, because George Whitfield was so effective at raising money for orphanages that uh, he always felt compelled to give. And so Benjamin Franklin would go to hear George Whitfield speak, but he would leave his change and his money at home. But George Whitfield, as an example, had a tongue of fire. John, John Wesley, many names throughout history. So tongues of fire indicate how the gospel would be proclaimed. Christianity was, and it is, say it is, it is, it is a faith of tongues of fire. It's inescapable. And of course, when God does move, when great things happen, when revival happens, God uses men and women who are willing to let their tongue be a tongue of fire for the Holy Spirit. Christianity was and is a faith of tongues of fire. Consider this. In a negative sense, James tells us the tongue, our tongue, can be set on fire by hell itself. Now that's the negative. That's the negative example. Our tongue can be misused in such a way that, as James says, it would seem as if it is set on fire by hell itself. Whereas with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we can have tongues of fire that declare the wonders of God. Now, which would you rather have? I know what I would rather. I would rather my tongue be used for good. I would rather my tongue be used for the kingdom of God. I would rather my tongue be used to be a blessing, to encourage rather than discourage, amen? So it's quite the contrast. James tells us the tongue can be set on fire by hell itself, or we can have a tongue that declares the wonders of God. In the book of Acts, as an example, Stephen, his tongue could not be stopped. And to get him to be quiet, to get his tongue to cease, to be silent, the religious leaders had to murder him and put him to death. In the book of Acts, you can read about the journeys of the Apostle Paul. Nearly everywhere he went, the religious, 
the religious Jews, but also the idol-worshiping Greeks and Romans, they opposed his tongue of fire everywhere he went. Acts 2 and verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Or the King James, I think, is great. It says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they spoke as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And again, in receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have to keep that in mind. The, the Holy Spirit is not going to make or force anyone to speak in other tongues. So we speak, and he gives us the utterance. And the last two Sundays, we've dealt with tongues and what that means biblically. In the book of Acts, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, so I'm not going to get more into that this evening. Third, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled. They, they weren't just, it wasn't just a small experience. They were filled. And the Holy Spirit could not fill them until they were new creations. Now, how would I describe being filled? It means to be immersed. It means to be immersed the entirety of your being. To be filled to the full, to be filled to overflowing. It's the difference between sticking your foot or your toe in a pool versus jumping in. That is what it's like to be filled. Fourth, they all spoke with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. So they were filled and they, were, they spoke. Now they were born again and they had received eternal life and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they now had the evidence of that, which is speaking in tongues. And they had the one who raised Christ from the dead living in them. He lives in us. Say, he's with me. He's Say, he is in me. Say it again. Say, he's with me, he's with me. and he is, in me. he is in me. And that's true no matter how you feel. And again, we, the, the presence of God is wonderful. There's nothing like feeling the presence of God, but we walk by faith, by the word of God, and not by how we feel. And there are times in prayer and worship that are very sweet and very wonderful, and we sense the presence of God. And then there are days that they're just not like that. And we're walking by faith and not by how we feel. We're walking by the word and not by how we feel. And so no matter how you feel, he is with you and he is in you. And uh, you know, when you're cold and you got all these circumstances going on, you may not feel very spiritual, but if you'll get quiet, who's still with you? And who still is wanting to speak to you and give you counsel and give you wisdom and maybe tell you that something you're about to do isn't the, the best idea you've ever had. He's with us and he is in us at all times, no matter how we feel, no matter the circumstances. And he wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. But again, as I shared a few Sundays ago, we have to cooperate. We have to be willing to be led. He's not going to force us. He's not going to make us. He's not going to make us do what's right. He wants to work in you. He wants to work through you. Say, he wants to work in me. He wants to work through me. And it's for your good, but it's also for the good of others, that they would become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and that their lives would be changed for the better. He wants to work in you and through you. So it's important that we be filled with the Holy Spirit, but it's also important that we live mindful of the fact and the reality that he now lives in us. 1 John 4 and verse 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you, say he's in me, he's in me. he is greater than the one who is in the world. So he's in us and because he's in us, we overcome. And you might say, Austin, what are we overcoming? Whatever's going on, amen? Whatever the circumstances are, we are overcoming because he's in us. Philippians 2 and verse 13, for it is God who works in you. Say, he's working in me. Working in and again, you might say, I don't feel like it. Again, we don't walk by how we feel. We walk by faith or by the word of God. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So we're born again. We have become his children. And now God, by the Holy Spirit, has made his home. He is his dwelling. He has tabernacled among us. Now he has tabernacled in us. He's with us, he's in us. Say, he is with me, and he is in me. And it's a challenge to live accordingly. And that's why Sunday we'll be dealing with living by the Spirit and not by the flesh. 
Because again, we, we live in this world, we have our sin nature, and so the default is to live by the flesh and not by the spirit. And so it is a daily challenge, it is a daily discipline to live by the spirit, not by the flesh. We'll deal with that Sunday. John 14, verse 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And I love that. We will come to him and make our home with him. Go back to the very beginning to Genesis. See it at the very beginning in Genesis. Let us, let us, let us make man, humankind in our image. And here, we will come to him and make our home with him. Father, Son, and Spirit. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Then Romans 8 and verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, of course, I read my father's letter this past Sunday, uh, encouraging Dr. Betty Price because her beloved husband, Fred Price, has gone to be with the Lord. And one of the things Fred Price was wonderful at is he would always talk about two sides of the coin. And he would explain that we can learn things in Scripture by looking at the opposite meaning. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So what's the flip side of that? Those who are not led by the Spirit of God are not the sons of God. Those who are not led by the Spirit of God are not the daughters of God. So if we belong to him, we ought to be led by him. If we are his, if we are saved, if we are born again, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we ought to be being led by the Holy Spirit. It is a sign of belonging to the family. It is a sign that we are his sons and we are his daughters. We are his children. Go to the book of Hebrews. A sign of spiritual legitimacy is discipline. The Lord disciplines those whom he loves. You've heard pastor give the example many times that when he's at the grocery store, somebody else's child is misbehaving. He doesn't, he doesn't do anything about it. They're not his child. Amen. And I know it's always embarrassing if your child misbehaves. Amen. So you want to get right on that and deal with that, handle that. And so just as discipline is an indication that we're a part of the family of God, he loves us, we belong to him, so is the fact that we are his if we're led by his spirit, leading us, guiding us, directing us. So we should live in the reality of the incarnation, the resurrection, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We should also live in the light of the reality of the righteousness that has been credited to us in Christ Jesus. So next we're going to deal with the reality of our righteousness, which is his righteousness that has been given it has been credited to us. Now, throughout most of church history, even after the Protestant Reformation, most of the church has been sin conscience. Most of the church, and most of the church throughout church history has been sin conscience. And the focus has been on sin and sinning. Now, if you remember, we dealt with part of this on January 17th and 24th and two Sunday morning messages on the order of Melchizedek. And in those messages, Pastor and I said that Aaron's priesthood under the covenant, under the old covenant, under the law, Aaron's priesthood had to do with sin and sinning, whereas Melchizedek's priesthood had to do with victory and winning. And in those two messages, we said as believers, we've got to get our focus off of sin and sinning and get our focus on winning. But so many believers, their focus is on sin. And they, they say things like, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and they, they get into this rut, this pattern of, well, I've just been doing the same sin for the last 10, 15 years, and I'm not going to have the victory until I get to heaven, and I say nonsense to all that. You can have the victory right now with the help of the Holy Spirit. He loves you. He'll help you. He'll help you overcome any temptation, and he'll give you the power to be set free from any problem, any bondage, any compulsive sin or habit, no matter what it is. All you have to do is be willing and ask for help, and he will help you. 
But a lot of believers, their focus is on sin and sinning. And many believers are sin conscious. They live their entire lives focused on sin and struggling with sin and often the same sins year after year, which are what we would call besetting sins. And that they're stumbling. But John tells us that if you know you're, you're stumbling, it's because you're walking in the dark. And if you don't want to stumble anymore, what do you do? Walk in the light. You know, that Monday morning when we woke up, realized the power was off, I realized, well, we were not prepared with candles and, you know, flashlights and all of that good stuff, amen? And uh, we, we woke up because uh, Samuel, he, he wakes up pretty on the dot at a certain time and uh, it was dark in his room and he, he did not make it to the bathroom without stumbling and falling over stuff. God bless him. So everybody was awake at that point. But if you don't want to stumble, you walk in the, the light. And so when believers are of this pattern of stumbling day after day and week after week, and it's problem to problem, defeat to defeat, there's never any victory, it's because they're not walking in the light. And many believers never get away from being sin conscious and focused on sin and sinning. And if you think about many, many hymns, many songs, even songs today, the, the focus is on sin and being forgiven of sin. And of course, is part of the covenant that we are forgiven of our sins? Yes. But is that all the covenant? Is that the beginning and the end? And the answer is no. What I would say is that is a starting point. But we're not going on to maturity if we stay at the starting point. But many songs, many hymns are about sin and forgiveness or the grace to just keep on committing the same sins again and again and again. You know, there are songs about grace, but if you re read the lyrics and read between the lines, the implication is, well, this, we need all this grace because we're living a life of defeat, struggling with the same things. And there are many sermons and the focus is on sin and sinning. And so the re sad reality is many believers don't know the freedom that they have in Christ from sin. They don't know the freedom that they have in Christ from being focused on sin and conscious of sin. So you got to get your focus off sinning, and you got to get your focus on winning. Got to get your focus off sinning, and get your focus on walking in the blessings of God. Let's go to Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 1. To understand the reality of our righteousness, we should all study and meditate upon Hebrews chapter 10. And all of Hebrews is wonderful, amen. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never. Say never. never. And so never means never. So E.W. Kenyon said, there's nothing sadder than a Christian under the new covenant trying to live as if they're under the law. And it is amazing the, the silly things that people get into to try and be pleasing to God. And that's just one example people get into today. But the author of Hebrews says, for this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible. Say, it is impossible. It is impossible. So we have some clear-cut words, never and now impossible. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish, to establish the second. So the first covenant, the old covenant, it has been set aside, or as it says elsewhere, it has been done away with. It has been made obsolete. And by that will, we have been, and the tense is past tense, we have been, say, I have been, I have been. made holy. Made say, holy. I, say, I have been, I have been. Made, holy. made holy. Now, now it's not because you or I did it. 
It's not because uh, we successfully did 25 things. It is because of what Jesus did on our behalf. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So once for all, it is finished, which means it is finished. We're not hoping so. We're not trying. We're not trying to get there. We, we don't have a list of all these things that we, we have to do to, to get into right standing with God. You and I, if you have repented of your sins, if you're born again, you have his spirit, you are in right standing with God right now. You might say, well, Austin, I got, I got frustrated driving over here and I, I said something unspiritual. Well, you may not feel as if you are the righteousness of God in Christ, but you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It has been done. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And the way I would explain this, reading the entirety of the New Testament, is we have been made holy and we are to live holy. And that takes us to Sunday morning coming up, which is we are to live a holy life. We are to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Because again, we, we, we live in the world. We were born into this world that's full of sin. And so our default is what nature? The spirit or the flesh? That's the flesh. And so we have been made holy, but we are to live holy. Verse 11, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never, never take away sins. Verse 12. So in contrast, what did Jesus do for our, on our behalf? But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So it is finished. His work is done. He sat down. Since that time, he waits for the enemies, his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. So say, I have been made, I have been made. Perfect, perfect forever. forever. And I know, it, you might think, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's out there. I don't feel perfect. You know, and I think we would all say none of us are perfect, amen. We are, as Paul said, aiming for perfection. But this is why we've got to come to the word of God. We've got to, to read about, learn about, meditate on what Christ did for us and then live in the reality of that. By one sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. And then verse 14, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. He has justified us forever. He has made us perfect forever, those who are being made holy. So you go to Romans 4, you learn that his righteousness has been credited or imputed or given to us. It has been reckoned to our account. And we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It is given. It is credited unto us. A few months ago, I went to the bank one day, made a deposit we make, and uh, the, the guy there, the teller, he wasn't paying attention. He added extra, an extra zero. And uh, I saw the slip when he sent it back through the window, and at first I thought, praise the Lord. <laughs> then I knew that wouldn't be right to dri drive off, so I said something, and he corrected it. Now, if he insisted, well, I guess I could say that that was credited to my account because that certainly was not the deposit that day, amen? So we, we didn't earn this. We didn't deserve this. It has been credited to our account. Jesus did the work on our behalf. His righteousness has been credited to us. And as it says in Hebrews 10, we have been made perfect forever. And that is what we call our justification. We have been made perfect forever. That is our justification, and we are being made holy. And what does it mean to be made holy? That is what is our ongoing sanctification. Now, you might think, man, Austin's throwing out some big words tonight. Well, these are important doctrines that Christians have held for a reason based on the Word of God. Our justification is our salvation. We have been made righteous in Christ. But there, we don't just end with our justification. And that's why it's so great that pastor's notes mention the Reformation because that's what the Reformation was all about. Martin Luther was studying Paul's epistle to the Roman church and he came to the grand discovery that we are justified, we are brought into right standing with God by faith. 
And so much of the focus in the Protestant Reformation was on justification, and that's wonderful because they recovered something that had been lost to the medieval church, but that's the beginning. That is not the end. And you go later in church history, and wonderful people like the Moravians and the Methodists, they discovered sanctification, that we have been justified, we have been brought into right standing with God, but we are also to be sanctified. And that, over time, led to Pentecostalism and things like Azusa, that uh, we're justified, we're sanctified, so we can be a fit vessel for who? The Holy Spirit to fill. To fill us, to be in us, to be with us, to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us. So we have been made perfect forever. That is our justification. And as it says in verse 14, we are being made holy. That is our ongoing sanctification. So sanctification is not a one-time work. We have been made holy, it says earlier, but we are also, we are being made holy, which is ongoing. So sanctification is not a one-time thing. You know, just because we did a great job living by the Spirit last week doesn't mean we're off the hook for this week. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, today we were loading up the car and Jessica said, you're being cranky. And I'll admit, I was being cranky, amen. So just because we did a great job, a great job living by the Spirit last week doesn't mean we're off the hook this week. So many believers, they, they know about their justification, but they don't know anything about sanctification. And that is living a holy and righteous and pure life before the Lord, or living by the Spirit and not by the flesh. They they know about justification, but they know very little about sanctification. Again, we have been made perfect forever. That is our justification, but we are being made holy. That is our ongoing sanctification. 